Hello there, everybody. Uh, I am Reverend Richard Nordgren, an associate member of St. John's Lutheran Church in beautiful you know, Greenpoint, Brooklyn, actually coming to you from equally beautiful Kew Gardens. You know. uh, on this hot summer evening, we will continue our study of scripture in a, um, a series called The Many Faces of God. Now, over the last number of weeks, we have examined you know, the different perspectives from which we can view God and understand uh, who God is uh, through our study of the books of the Old Testament. We've gone through a number of the historical works, you know, the, some of the uh, prophets, have uh, gone through the, the Psalms, and tonight we're going to be looking at Proverbs. Now, this is an interesting book, you know, and if you haven't read it, you've probably seen lots of it you know, on bumper stickers or refrigerator magnets. The, um, the wisdom of Proverbs you know, lends itself to such venues. But first, let's set this in context. You know? um, you've heard me say on you know, multiple occasions, probably ad nauseum, uh, that the, uh, the, 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 the whole nexus, the framework you know, for understanding the Old Testament is to look at it as the record of God's you know, self-revelation. Um, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in the historical works, um, we have the record of, of God's you know, self-disclosure, um, making clear what his wishes and will is. Um, and we've seen that God has done this in a variety of ways. Uh, early in the, uh, the study, we looked at the multitude of ways that, that God's you know, self-disclosure was done through a variety of creative acts. Uh, later on, as historical circumstances changed, we saw you know, God in a new light you know, as the protector and defender of, of his people. Uh, we have seen God being frustrated and angry with them uh, as they uh, drifted off into idolatry and uh, into uh, injustices and sinful behavior. Uh, um, hoping to um, make the expectations and requirements um, and the promises and the fulfillment of them uh, more concrete. There was a, a covenant which was you know, given to Israel at Sinai, sometimes called the Mosaic Covenant or the law. It is uh, actually you know, a, a, not just a body of law, but it is a, an agreement that spells out the terms and conditions of all parties. Uh, we are humans by nature and uh, either by you know, ill-founded desires or um, uh, rapid uh, curiosity, or maybe a host of other reasons just because we're stubborn and like doing things our own way. Um, we, we have a track record of um, being self-centered, self-interested, and self-concerned, uh, which on many occasions has caused harm to our neighbor and uh, insult to God. God thought that perhaps if there was a monarchy, uh, that uh, people would uh, listen to what the, the king had to say and, uh, oh, fo and follow the requirements that God had laid out and entrusted to the monarchs as viceroy and agent on earth. Well, as Lord Acton said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And kings are what kings are. You know, they like the privileges of position, you know, the, uh, the thrill of having power, uh, the ability to make things happen is very intoxicating. And oftentimes they were the worst offenders of the people they were set to govern. Uh, God gave up on the monarchy as, as an institution for the fulfillment of his purposes and instead you know, turned to prophets. Um, they uh, issued warnings and gave hope, uh, but they too you know, failed to execute the, uh, the hope for achievements you know, that were laid out in the, the, the covenant. And last week we... Uh, uh, take, took a look at you know, how ordinary people you know, looked at the situation in this, this model of rewards and punishments. 
blessings and curses, as uh, the Bible would say. And uh, we came to several conclusions. You know, um, one is that people discovered that uh, you know they don't need you know go-betweens in order to make their needs known to God. They don't need someone to pray on their behalf. They have direct access to God. And in the Psalms, we find that repeatedly. You know, individuals and communities, you know, lifting up laments. Uh, grievances, joys, and petitions. There are others during this time when the, the Psalms were being composed, you know, who took a very dim view of uh, circumstances and had a rather gloomy, pessimistic forecast for the future. Um, they saw a little chance or possibility that you know, the people of God would mend their ways, repent of their sins, uh, and turn to the true faith and righteousness um, and uh, so these apocalyptic writers, such as Haggai and Zechariah uh, and Malachi, you know, imagine that it would take a, a cosmic clash between good and evil uh, for a faithful remnant to emerge from that apocalyptic battle uh, to take over a renewed and regenerated world. The Proverbs that we are studying tonight, you know, is uh, an entirely different breed. You know? uh, Proverbs either looks to a, a glorious future. Uh, it's more concerned with the day-to-day the -day redress of grievances, the sharings of, of joys and happinesses in life, um, hope and assurance that, you know, tomorrow will be you know, better than today. You know? There's a... Uh, is not the, the fervor or urgency of the prophets in, in Proverbs. Um, it's, it's more of a book of you know, common sense practices and principles. You know? um, and the book of Proverbs you know, uh, borrowed heavily you know, from the surrounding countries and people um, and incorporated the wisdom of experience that um, they had you know, on their own, and what they learn from the experience and wisdom of their neighbors. They may not always have been on good terms, you know, with the Edomites or the Egyptians or the Philistines, but they are willing to borrow, you know, the, uh, the things which seemed like they were just, you know, good ideas and incorporate that into the compilation that we have the uh, and now as a book of Psalms. Um, Many of the uh, traditional understandings of Proverbs is that they are the distilled wisdom of Solomon. There's, there's much evidence internally in the book of Proverbs that indicates very clearly that uh, Solomon was not the author of all or perhaps most of the book of Proverbs. Uh, I think the best we can give him credit for is the, um, the possibility that he might have accumulated compiled and published you know, the book that we have now, at least in part. But subsequent editors and authors contributed to the book that we now have in our possession. Uh, and like during the time of Zechariah and then some hard to uh, identify in the period when there was a King Lemuel, um, but there is parts of Proverbs which are, are credited to, to those people. You may ask, you know, who were the folks who found Proverbs, you know, a useful book? That's a good question. You know? um, uh, we, uh, you can, you can, you know, conclude with a fair degree of certainty that, you know, Proverbs appeal to certain classes within the Israelite society, and probably was not too much of a, of a current concern for others. Uh, the priests, such as the Levites, you know, they had the, the Torah and the traditions which governed how they practiced you know, the religious rites and rituals. The, uh, the uh, apocalyptic fanatics you know, were not interested in the uh, adjustment and improvement of society. They looked for a whole, wholesale and large scale makeover of society. So they were they were not interested in perfecting and sustaining the status quo, but there is you know, one group in society that would have been interested in the wisdom 
uh, that's contained in Proverbs. And that's the, uh, the young and up and coming bureaucrats. Bureaucrats and royal functionaries, you know, would have kept Proverbs at their bedside, but it could, because it contained the rules of practice that they would have found very advantageous in the development of their career. We can see where Proverbs is headed by uh, reading selected portions of it. And if I could have a volunteer to read the first six verses of the first chapter, I'd really appreciate that. I'll read it. Thank you. So Proverbs chapter one, verses one through six, right? Yes. Um, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. For learning about wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for gaining instruction in wise dealing, righteousness, justice, and equity, to teach shrewdness to the simple, knowledge and prudence to the young. Let the wise also hear and gain in hearing, and the discerning acquire skill to understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. Okay, thank you, Tess. Yeah. Um, you know, as, you, as you listen to what she just read, um, the, uh, the, the tone was, you know, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to be guided by um, so as you can get, get ahead in life and have a good life. Um, it doesn't say anything really about you know, this wisdom that they extol uh, as leading to behaviors and uh, attitudes which are, are pleasing to God. Um, so the, you know, the, the focus you know, of, of Proverbs you know, is really toward you know, what you can expect if you do certain things and uh, what won't happen if you do other things. It's, um, it's called the, you know, the rule of natural consequences. You know, we use this to teach our kids you know, good behavior all the time. You know, we uh, say to, you know, we said to our kids on many occasions, you know, um, if you continue to do this, you know, it's going to cause you difficulty. If you do something else, you know, it will cause you happiness. Uh, think about that. You know? uh, every choice, every decision, every action has its consequence. Um, what we've looked at in you know, the Old Testament scripture to date you know, is not based on this, this rule of natural consequences. You know? Um, there are promised rewards and curses, you know, for, for behavior. And uh, you know, the, uh, the law, which is given at Sinai, is taken as the supreme culmination of divine self-revelation on the part of God to his people, Israel. The psalmists, you know, and the prophets proclaim God as the haven for the wretched, you know, and the afflicted on the earth all within that Deuteronomic model, you know, that said that, you know, if you do well, you will prosper. If, you know, if you don't obey, you will be punished. Uh, what we read, you know, so far suggests that uh, uh, there's no need for God's intervention. And Megan, I would like you to, to read, you know, another passage, which I think illustrates that. And that's in the second chapter, verses 9 through 19. Okay. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. Those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. You will be saved from the loose woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the partner of her youth and forgets her sacred covenant, 
for her way leads down to death and her paths to the shades. Those who go to her never come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Okay. Well, that sounds dark. Yeah, All right. yeah. But you know what, what you might notice in there is the absence of God. The blessings and the uh, uh, punishments that uh, he warns about uh, in, in this section of, of Proverbs are the natural consequences of choices that people make. Yeah. It's not that God is the um, overlooking, overseeing, uh, hold you accountable and love you to death if you do well um, sort of deity. Um, God is, is, is not mentioned. You know? And there's an assumption that there's no need for an ad hoc intervention on the part of God, except in unusual and extraordinary circumstances. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to read about that you know, in a section from the third chapter of Proverbs, and I'll be reading from verses 13 through 18. Happy are those who find wisdom and those who get understanding, for her income is better than silver and her revenue better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. The ways are the ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who hold, they hold of her. And those who hold her fast are called happy. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down with the dew. A um, couple of things in, in this passage, which I think are noteworthy. Um, one is that wisdom is feminine. We'll be getting into that a little bit. So just hold on to that idea for a bit. Okay? Um, the, uh, the other thing is, is that I've said earlier that um, um, you know, if you if you do the common sense thing, um, if you do what you know you, you know in your heart is what you're supposed to do, the rewards uh, are, are are going to be there for you. And um, uh, God only has come into the the picture at this point, you know, uh, as the creator of all that is. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, the Lord is uh, is wise also, but uh, God's wisdom you know, was on display in creation, and um, the, the author of Proverbs does not seem to think you know, that uh, there has been much evidence of that ever since. Um, Lady Wisdom you know, is the uh, uh, the person that you know if if she is listened to. Good things will happen. Okay. Um, throughout at uh, Proverbs, there is an admonition that uh, runs something like this: "Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom." But if you try to, you know, figure that out, what it means literally, you know, it you know, is really just nonsense. Right? <coughs> um, but it can be taken to you know, to mean with some nuancing. Um, that wisdom teaches us that there is much about the world that is incomprehensible. It also means wisdom you know, is the aid which people need for a well-ordered life. It also means that life itself is beyond personal control. Wisdom teaches that petitioning God you know, to right wrongs uh, is just as likely to be met by a no um, as by a yes. Um, in this section and in, in others, um, wisdom is extolled as uh, the personification of prudence, um, probity, gravity, uh, and uh, sage wisdom. It's uh, Contrasted with the uh, the passions of, of lust that uh, can run loose, 
uh, the passions of um, self-aggrandizement, uh, the passions of suit of self-interest. Um, that's the contrast. You know? It's not a contrast between good and evil, you know, between right and wrong. You know, it's it's a con it's a contrast between you know emotional states, you know, um, between you know, wise serenity and uh, foolish you know impulsiveness. Um, in some ways, proverbs uh, predate, um, but certainly predict you know, a philosophy uh, that developed in Greece um, and extended throughout the Roman Empire. It's a philosophy called Stoicism. Uh, right now, one of the, uh, the chief recorders of Stoic wisdom, Marcus Aurelia, Aurelius, you know, who wrote a book called Meditations, you know, is, is still a very good selling book. You know? And um, um, the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, um, was influenced by later Stoics. Um, uh, and from them, he learned you know, that uh, it's important to be aware of who you are, to have mindfulness, um, you know, to consider the consequences of things that you're considering doing, uh, not to rush into things hastily or without diligent planning. You know. um, but it is also a philosophy in which God is pushed you know, further and further to the sidelines. You know. uh, as the pursuit of wisdom in a stoic you know, setting you know, gains ascendancy. Uh, God has is given or has fewer and fewer opportunities to not only intervene, but fewer opportunities to communicate, you know, purposes and desires. Um, after you get through Proverbs, you know, um, you wonder, wow, how did that get into scripture after you, you know, got immersed in the, the prophets that preceded it, you know? Uh, you wonder, you know, how did this make it into the canon? Because uh, it lacks the ferocity and fervor and passion of the uh, uh, the, the proverbs and uh, of the prophets and uh, some of the rulers of, of Israel, you know, such as Moses. Um, so we uh, we look at proverbs and come away from it and say, yeah, there's an acknowledgement of God. You know? But wisdom is the is the main protagonist. You know? uh, if you think of it as a uh, a picture, um, God is the frame surrounding the uh, uh, the picture itself. The, the focus uh, is on the the picture, not the frame. Um, and in Proverbs, there's you know, um, not too many opportunities in its in and of itself where we see God has intervened in the immediate past. And the, uh, the law of natural consequences you know, it operates very well in the world. Um, it uh, even makes the very possibility of, of sin seem unimportant. Uh, there is a suggestion of uh, uh, that there may be uh, a life after death in chapter 15. But that's not held out as the uh, the promise of delayed compensation for earthly behavior that was never rewarded or punished in life. There's uh, one more section that uh, I ask a reader to uh, read for us, and that's chapter 11, um, beginning at the verse 31st verse, and continuing through the next chapter into verse 7. Yes, would you be up for that? Sure, one second. Um, to verse seven. Sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Okay. So chapter 11, verse 31 through chapter 12, verse seven, right? Yeah. Um, if the righteous are repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, 
but those who hate to be rebuked are stupid. The good obtain favor from the Lord, but those who devise evil he condemns. No one finds security by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will never be moved. A good wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are just, the advice of the wicked is treacherous. The words of the wicked are a deadly ambush, but the speech of the upright delivers them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. Okay. Well, uh, the concept of sin is, is really quite absent from that passage. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it assumes that, you know, Common sense is, is going to happen in this life, not in any life that um, they mer there may be after this one. Earlier, I asked you to hold on to the idea that uh, wisdom is personified in the feminine. Uh, throughout the sections that we read today, you know, that uh, uh, wisdom is, is very much a female figure. And so it, uh, conjures up the, uh, the interesting question. What is the relationship between wisdom and God? God has always been clearly male in personification. You know? uh, there has never been a suggestion of, uh, uh, of a feminine side of God. In the many faces that we looked at, you know, they, they've all had masculine tones. Now we see you know, wisdom, which um, is, is the, the center feature in this picture. God is the frame of the picture to be sure. You know? But we have you know, a female figure who has been the, the center of attention. So I'm gonna ask you to, you know, to think about this. You know, what is the relationship between wisdom as we understand it from Proverbs in relationship to God? Megan, what do you think? I think that they kind of go pretty hand in hand and one kind of like complements the other one very nicely. Like, it seems like, you know, I don't know. It just seems like it's a little bit more tempered. Like it's, it's not as like, you know, I don't know. I feel like, you know, the, up until now, it seemed like, you know, God just was kind of pissed at everybody for not really getting it quite <laughs> right here. It's like a little bit more of like a, a, a roadmap, if you will, to kind of like, guide people like but not like a, not like the commandments where it's very much like don't do this this and this and then they don't tell you how to kind of you know maybe not do those things I guess like this kind of gives you a little bit more I don't know guidance I think it just kind of seems like that to me okay well what you're suggesting is that wisdom is God's consort yeah yeah that's yeah, it. yeah that's what I'm getting I thank you Richard. Okay. So you know, <laughs> what, what comes to mind then as you as you think of it in, in those terms, you know, is is like the um, the family where the uh, the kid goes to dad and said, Hey dad, can I have 20 bucks? You know, I want to go out with my friends tonight. And dad says, No, you gotta stay home and do your chores. So the kid goes to mom and says, Hey mom, you know, I really want to go out with my friends tonight. Can I have twenty dollars? And she smiles and says, yes. <laughs> uh, now, what do you think, uh, Tess, about the relationship of wisdom and God? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it goes with that same idea of this. But, you know, initially, first, I was thinking about it as a sort of balance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like things that like, you know, what you and Ma Megan have mentioned, you know, pretty much is the same. It is the sort of, uh, it is a balance, you know, it's not always like this male dominated reality, right? It's, 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 um, it's, it is that different point of view. Although it's funny in our house, I'm always like, go ask your dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that parent. Yeah. Um, but you know, it is, I, I do think it is, it, is coming from this like sense of finding um, a balance really. Um, I feel like I'd need to think about it more, but that's sort of, you know, that that was my initial reaction when you mentioned it, 
when you okay. mentioned that like wisdom was portrayed as feminine. Yeah. There, there's several other possibilities which I think are uh, worthy of consideration. Uh, one is that uh, you, you could possibly think of wisdom as a competitor. Um, not necessarily be uh, a divine competitor, uh, uh, not a god in her own right, you know, but nevertheless, you know, a competitor, and one that has far more legitimacy um, than the idols which Israel so often turned to. Uh, another possibility, which you know both of you have suggested uh, already, but I want to lift up, is that. You know, perhaps we're seeing here the beginning of a new synthesis. Um, the, um, the track that we've taken so far is one where the, the different images of God become integrated and concatenated, if you will. Um, the creative and the destructive, you know, uh, find a union. And out of that union, you know, uh, comes God, who is the protector and defender of Israel. Uh, so we we have uh, seen God, who was you know, as Megan said, really pissed off at you know our misbehavior, um, tempered also you know by the uh, compassion and sympathy for his people, uh, who were swept up you know in a horrible cataclysm, um, and saw the destruction of their, their city, their, their capital, their country, um, and forced into exile. And God showed them you know, tender mercies. Um, so throughout our study, you know, with those two examples in mind, you know, we, we found that uh, God, you know, that sometimes comes across you know, in one way and then comes across in not too distant future uh, and, as its opposite. And then a little bit further down the road, somehow the two of them are merged and blended. Um, and we have you know, a, a new face of God to look at. And I would suggest that that is a possibility you know, that the, the feminine aspect of, of God you know, is, um, uh, is, is, well, it, it's not, I, Proverbs doesn't go that far, but I open up the possibility that you know, because of Proverbs, you know, that you know, the feminine will be incorporated into the makeup and nature of God. You know? um, and I think you know, once we get to the, the New Testament, um, the, the concern that Jesus had for the least and the lost you know, um, is definitely a sign that uh, you know, those traits that we consider unmasculine you know, are the first and foremost in the way Jesus comes across to, to us and as well as to his contemporaries. So, but as it stands, um, Proverbs by a book, you know, lends itself to uh, uh, cutting and pasting into bumper stickers and refrigerator magnets. Um, it's uh, you know, terse little tidbits of, of wisdom which can be easily memorized and, and uh, quoted you know, in appropriate circumstances. Uh, but on, on the, the broader scope of things, you know, um, we find the possibility that uh, wisdom you know, is, is different from, you know, from God in significant ways, but offers up you know, in, in some sort of you know, either consort relationship or an amalgamation, uh, a takeover. Uh, uh, producing a, a different sort of face of God than what we have seen so far. So with that, you know, I will close us up for tonight. I uh, want to remind you all that uh, next Sunday is the 4th of July, and we will not be having class on that evening. Uh, we'll meet again in two weeks, uh, where we will go through, no doubt, my favorite book of the Old Testament, the Book of Job. That's all I need to say. Does anybody have any last questions or comments that they want to interject? Okay. Well, let's close with prayer.
Lord, you offer us wisdom in abundance. You know, we find it everywhere. We've learned from our mistakes. We've been really smart. We've learned from the mistakes other people made. Um, in our mistakes, you know, we can see not only your, your graciousness and mercy, but also, you know, you provide us with opportunities for, for learning and improvement. But may we take, you know, the distilled wisdom of the ages, you know, and use it to guide our, our lives so that they would be prudent, you know, and happy. Uh, may we use the, you know, the wise and sage understandings of your people in all places and times you know, to know, you know, what is going to make for a good life. So we ask you to, to bless us this night, to have a special blessing for those in special needs, those who are troubled in body, mind, and spirit, for places on this earth which need peace far more than we can imagine. We lift up to you the, the families of those who are in that apartment collapse in Florida. We pray your comfort will touch their hearts in this time of uncertainty and sadness. Lord, in all things, you know, may we turn to you for guidance and to give you thanks and praise. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.